Good morning, folks, and welcome here. I'm Joe Long, the Curator of Education of the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum. I see that we are an elite crowd this morning, uh, so I look forward to taking a stroll through our gallery and uh, introducing you to some of our great banners here and a little bit to the concepts and ideas and traditions surrounding military flags. Uh, so bear with me as we're going to roll through. Hope nobody gets seasick here as we enter the hallowed halls. Hallowed halls of a museum which has been a museum for more than 120 years. And we're happy to uh, remain a place of learning and connection with the past today. I'm going to be watching for more folks to uh, join us underway, so please forgive me. It's always uh, a bit of a challenge to be presenting and managing the Zoom controls at the same time. Uh, but as we stroll in, one of the first things that strikes the eye here, and, and it's a deliberate part of our exhibit design, is this flag of the 1st Regiment, South Carolina Volunteers. And this is where it would be a little bit nicer to be here in person. You can't really see from where you are how big that thing is. This might help. The flag of the 1st South Carolina Volunteers is a huge banner and a very distinguished one as well. And we're going to talk about the history of this flag a little bit today. Uh, but first, to speak of flags in general and the military traditions surrounding flags and the customs and courtesies that we all follow, hopefully, surrounding flags. An important thing to realize is that the, the special ways that we treat flags, the special respect that we have for flags, uh, those, uh, those customs all come from a flag once historically being a very important part of command and control and communication on battlefields. Uh, it, it's not randomly just venerating a piece of cloth. Uh, it has deep roots in history. When you march out onto a battlefield in close order, just like uh, drill field maneuvers today, ceremonial troops or uh, your favorite college marching band. Um, walking in those formations on a battlefield, you didn't have great communication options. You know, every vehicle has a radio today. Individual soldiers have advanced communications where they can receive instructions and pass on information all the time. But out there in the battle line with your musket going off and muskets going off next to you uh, with uh, men screaming and falling, horses galloping, cannons thundering to transmit orders and to keep control of a formation under those conditions uh, was a real challenge and required some visual markers. And one important visual thing was the flag. And the battle flag of a regiment was often the most significant as far as operating on the battlefield. Uh, in the 1860s, that means about a thousand men uh, packed together, covering an area of front about equivalent to a four man fire team today with automatic weapons, uh, about the same lateral front distance for that packed together regiment. And this regimental banner becomes a, a visual marker and the color bearer is uh, always close enough to the commanding officer to hear the verbal orders. 
you as an individual soldier perhaps or not, but you can still follow the flag. And the flags also became a symbol of regimental honor, but that was secondary. First, they were important for command and control. If you had taken away an enemy flag, you had really sort of cut the command chain in a sense in that regiment. And the soldier who's left without that banner or the ability to hear orders uh, is no longer so much a soldier in a regiment as he is just a guy holding a weapon in the middle of a horrifying mess, uh, beginning to make independent decisions for himself because he can't get the command decisions. Uh, the importance of a banner is introduced here by a wonderful military historian who um, coincidentally later became president of the United States. His name is Theodore Roosevelt. And how he described that from immemorial time, the armies of every warlike people have set the highest value upon the standards they bore to battle. Standard being another term for the battle flag. To guard one's own flag against capture is the pride capture the flag of one's enemy, the ambition of every valiant soldier. In consequence, in every war between peoples of good military record, feats of daring performed by color bearers are honorably common. Well, we'll return to Theodore Roosevelt's essay on the flag bearers shortly. First, let's give this banner a little bit of a closer look. Every flag in our gallery uh, really has at least two stories around it that could be looked at. There's the stories of the men who followed the flag, the soldiers who carried it or received it or hid it or captured it, uh, the action stories from the front. And then behind every created object is a story of the people who created it. How and why? I hope you're able to visit us in person eventually to get up close to this flag and see the beautiful hand work that was done to embroider the name 1st Regiment, 1st Regiment South Carolina Volunteers, and the various plants featured in the wreath here surrounding that. Uh, this was a tremendous amount of hand work done by a group of ladies in Charleston. And the ladies were usually the creators and the presenters of a flag, especially of a very individual flag like this one. Uh, in fact, the oldest flag in our gallery is sort of catty corner to it, this silk banner much faded, represented the Abbeville Dragoons. And the Abbeville Dragoons formed in 1833. That's in response to the nullification crisis, a peacetime military unit, but with an ominous symbol chosen. Uh, the palmetto in this case is on the back of the flag instead of the front. And the front of the flag has gathering storm clouds, um, almost certainly a reference to the nullification crisis and the expectation that sooner or later, and it would come almost 30 years later, uh, there was going to be a uh, terrible sectional fight uh, that these men who are actually going to be fathers of men who grew up to fight in the Confederate Army uh, are anticipating almost 30 years earlier. But the creation and presentation of one of these banners, um, there's a lot to be learned from that about the society that it's coming from. Um, you see, for one thing, the palmetto becoming very common on South Carolina flags. Uh, palmettos are also featured on this War of 1812 era coats, buttons. And the palmetto was a symbol 
because of the Battle of Fort Moultrie in the American Revolution, the palmetto had become, in a way, a symbol of defiance. You see this fort made of palmetto logs. It's sort of a spongy wood, and it was very good at repelling or actually absorbing enemy cannon fire. Uh, palmettos didn't bust into splinters that became deadly secondary projectiles like harder wood did, but absorbed the cannon fire, uh, took a beating and remained in place. And so the palmetto became uh, the unofficial South Carolina symbol. It would not become official for nearly 100 years. Uh, for a long time, the state flag itself was simply the flag with a crescent shape on it. And the palmetto was featured on individual militia flags made by local units. Everybody knew it referred to South Carolina and to martial spirit, the spirit of the defender. Um, but it wasn't officially on the state flag, simply on militia gear, which leads to another cool thing about these flags. I'm going to take a second here to share some close-ups we can't get easily in the gallery. Here is a beautiful embroidered palmetto on a company flag that was the first flag used for the 1st Regiment, South Carolina Volunteers. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's a beautiful job. And this is the back of that very same flag. So the front, palmetto, the back. We have uh, another of those wreaths of plants being featured. Uh, a Latin motto, pro patria, for your country more literally sort of for your fatherland, uh, for the land of your fathers, um, the, the root word of patriotism. 1861, company and no company letter. Um, this beautiful piece of hand work wound up being incomplete because the regiment borrowed this unfinished company banner to carry in a parade, uh, promising of course to return it for completion and then Never brought it back. Uh, but one thing to note here, one second. I'm gonna get fancy and try to annotate for you all a bit. Maybe I shouldn't. Okay, this area right here, can you see that on this side of the wreath, we have a different set of plants than on this side? These are laurel, and laurel was the symbol of victory. The other side is oak, the little acorns for identifiable acorns if you get close to it. And oak, of course, is a symbol of strength. And wove, weaving together victory and strength in this banner, we see the little Valentine looking hearts intertwined at the bottom is the love of the people at home. That is what is seen as binding together strength and victory for their first regiment, South Carolina volunteers. And when you do come into our gallery, here's the banner behind me. And you can come and get a closer look at this wonderful piece of work. So the first South Carolina volunteers are a Confederate unit in 1861. They are literally the first unit that is formed. So when they call themselves the first, they really are. And the big flag of the first completed later and carried off to battle, the one you saw on the way in, a big huge one over there. That would become one of the most famous regimental flags in American history because of a battle in 1861 and an essay in the 1890s. Um, those are two ways to change the world. I, I do recommend the essay whenever possible. Uh, the battle had to come first. At that battle in 1862, 
at a place called Gaines Mill, Virginia. The flag of the first was being carried by a 16-year-old soldier. His name was James Taylor. He was from Edgefield, South Carolina. And he knew that his job was an important one. As we discussed, a banner was not just um, something that was a symbol, but rather a banner, uh, a, a battle flag was part of control and communications on the, on the battlefield. And this is why we have a tradition today that the flag is not supposed to touch the ground, for instance. Um, uh, you know, that's a terrible embarrassment if you trip because the color bearer and the flag touches the ground in the parade. Uh, you're not supposed to have the flag touch the ground. This is not about keeping the flag from getting dirty. Uh, this is because a banner which is not held high overhead on the battlefield where the men can see it is useless for leading them. That flag has to be kept up and visible. And that is part of the job of what was called the color guard. Today, a pleasant ceremonial duty, marching along in a parade in a very sharp uniform. Uh, in the 1860s or the 1770s or uh, during that entire black powder era, a deadly serious and very dangerous job on the battlefield. And young James Taylor is getting an extra dollar in his pay every month. And he's getting an extra chevron to wear on his uniform at the time. And here you see him in his early war uniform from an original photo. He's wearing one of those uh, hardy hats that were popular at the beginning. It's got a woven palmetto on the front of it. And this proud young soldier is ordered forward with the troops across the battlefield. And this is where I'm going to revisit that account that I began to read you from um, President Roosevelt's musings on the flag bearers of the 1860s. At Gaines Mill, where Gregg's first South Carolina formed part of the attacking force, the resistance was desperate. The fury of the assault unsurpassed. It fell the lot of this regiment to bear the brunt of carrying a certain strong position. In other words, they're moving forward against strong defenses. Moving forward at a run, the South Carolinians were swept by a fierce and searching fire. Young James Taylor, a lad of 16, was carrying the flag and was killed after being shot down three times, twice rising and struggling onward with the colors. An eyewitness who was there that day reported that Taylor was first struck in the left arm. Uh, 58 caliber round, about the size of my thumb. And that Taylor, with his arm hanging uselessly at his side, used his right arm to drop the huge flagpole on his right hip. And remember how big that flag was, to move forward across the field until he was struck for the second time. That's when he turned to Camp Colonel Hamilton, according to the other account, and he said, sir, I don't know how much longer I can carry this flag. Hit for a third time, Taylor may have been dead before he hit the ground. The flag did not hit the ground because he, another young man reached out to take hold of it. Edmund Shubrick Hain. Kubrick Haynes shown here in a cadet uniform, but he had left college in order to join the army. And Kubrick Haynes had a lot to prove. Uh, his grandfather was a well-known officer in the Continental Navy. Uh, his father was also a naval officer, a naval officer in the United States Navy by that day in 1862, fighting on the opposite side. And Shubrick Haynes' mama was not pleased about this. She sent the young man away reportedly with the words, Edward, your, Edmund, your name is in disgrace because of your father. You must be the one to redeem it. And whatever Shubrick Haynes had to prove, he proved pretty swiftly in only a few steps. He too was shot down and a third teenager stepped forward to carry the flag. 
I won't keep going with details, but they did. They did keep going. Five teenagers in less than five minutes fell carrying that banner at Gaines Mill. Roosevelt writes that the sixth, no less brave but more fortunate, picked up the flag to carry it forward. Dominic Spellman was that man, and I had the privilege a few years ago of meeting one of his descendants, a young man who came in to ask about an ancestor who had something to do with one of our artifacts. And the young man asking the question was wearing a brand new uniform of the United States Army. He had just graduated from Fort Jackson basic training and was on his way to his next assignment. That's a big story about the development of our museum and about the historiography of the war. You see, when Teddy Roosevelt wrote his essay, The Flag Bearers, he chose four flags that had stories of great courage about them, two Northern and two Southern, suggesting that the issues of the war were settled, the bravery of the men became a heritage, no matter which side they were on, that belongs to all Americans today. Here's the front of that first South Carolina flag. And you'll see that this one, just like the other one I pointed out to you, has the palmetto in the middle. This one has the crescent too, and laurels representing victory on one side, acorns and oak leaves representing strength are on the other. So one of the neat things about a personal flag, a local unit flag, uh, often representing a company, was that the front of the flag would tell the world who you are. It had the palmetto and the name of your unit more often than not, if it was a South Carolina flag. The back of the flag, however, was an editorial spot. That was where the people who created the flag could send a personal message to the soldiers themselves. Uh, this is the back of the flag of the Lexington Guards from South Carolina. It's painted on silk, and you can see it says, Defend this, the homes of your mothers, wives, and sisters. Uh, the enforcers, in many ways, of the concept of duty were the ladies. These are the ones who set the standards for male behavior, and uh, the men were powerfully motivated to live up to the ladies' expectations. And that leads me to one of my favorite flags here in the gallery. Um, hoping we can get close to it. Get a decent look at the flag, there we go, of the Martin Guards. And as you see, presented by the Ladies of Lawrence, it says at the bottom, and the flag of the Martin Guards, of course, has the palmetto. I don't know if you can make out the gold letters at the top, the state's Latin motto, Anime Opibusque Parati, is at the top there, the Martin Guards. But the wonderful thing about the conservation of the Martin Guards flag uh, was that it just so happened that this flag was on two pieces of silk which could both be saved and both be stored. On the back of the wall here, We have the back of the Martin Guards flag and the personal message that the Ladies of Lawrence chose to send. Uh, they went the direction of reminding the men of their values and what they're fighting for. Constitution and liberty, it says. And then two verses chosen from the Bible. Uh, one of them is from the Old Testament, Psalm 20, verse 5. In the name of the Lord our God, we will set up our banner, it used to say. And then from Galatians in the New Testament, a book, uh, a verse about liberty. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, begins the verse, and it's juxtaposed under the word liberty. But each group of ladies chose uh, individual sentiments that they wanted to put on the back of these company flags. Now, a company was about 100 men in the 1860s, and very often a company flag, since it wasn't carried to battle, uh, survived because the next guy to get sick or go on furlough was quietly given the beautiful handmade company flag and said, you know, told to take that home, 
and keep it safe. Uh, and so we do have some terrific company flags that survived that are here in the Relic Rooms collection. Uh, while we're here, a pet peeve of mine about terminology from the war can be displayed. Great big garrison flag in back of me. This flew someplace on the South Carolina coast. And again, I'll show you, this is a, this is a big one. This is a large flag. Uh, again, we see the state's Latin motto, but we also see the design of this flag based on this right here. This flag from the 1860s, this flag design, this is called the first national flag of the Confederacy. This is the flag that was carried into battle at first Manassas. Um, the, the more familiar Confederate banners didn't exist yet at that point. This is the one that was carried at that first battle. And you can see the problem with it. If the wind isn't blowing and the flag is kind of hanging down, it's very hard to tell this from a United States flag at a distance. And that's why they changed the design. But before they changed the design, new songs and poems were written and they featured the nickname of this flag. The nickname was the Stars and Bars. It has some stars uh, and it has three broad bars. Well, later flag designs like this third national came out. But the songs and the poems did not change. The nickname Stars and Bars, which applied only to the original flag, went down as a phrase in history. And now you'll hear people referring to the St. Andrew's Cross Confederate battle flags as stars and bars, uh, which they're not. There are no bars on those flags. So there's my little pet peeve addition to terminology for today. All right, continuing to roll through our gallery. I'm gonna take a look at a very distinguished and unusual South Carolina battle flag. In fact, it is the only surviving Union flag of South Carolina troops. You can see that it's not in the best condition. I've got a close up for you in a second of what's left of this flag. Silk, a silk banner, which is one of the reasons it's so far degenerated. Um, you have to be here and look closely to see the tiny bit of gold paint right there that represents all that's left of one of the stars that was painted in the blue field of this Union banner. These soldiers, all South Carolina men from the Low Country, from the Beaufort District, rallied to the Union colors after that area was captured very early in the war by the Union Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, in fact, the capture included Paris Island, which is where these men would take their basic training to fight for the Union. The first US military people to take their basic training in Paris Island uh, were not actually United States Marines, but rather soldiers of this and other South Carolina Union regiments. Every man in those regiments was a former slave. And while it was a complex war and men fought for very different reasons, I think that we can confidently say that every one of these men was an abolitionist as well. Um, these men were men who had been slaves, were now soldiers and would fight for their own freedom and that of their families. And a unit that would take horrible casualties at a place called Honey Hill where they were assigned to storm across a bridge, a bridge that was a, a kill zone with interlocking fields of fire from entrenchments uh, flanking it on both sides. It was just a terrible tactical decision in my humble opinion. And in the opinion of the soldiers caught in the crossfire and in the opinion of a Confederate teenager who wrote afterwards that he felt like these men had been used as a breastworks by the other Yankees. Uh, so they made their sacrifices uh, and had a terrible war. 
And this is the last of the banners of the South Carolina Union regiments that remains. Uh, there were others. There were other banners surviving. We believe most of them uh, were destroyed at West Point earlier or early in the 20th century uh, when a regulation book said that flags that were worn out should be respectfully retired uh, that was destroyed by the cadets in the ceremony. Uh, and so this is all that's left of one of those five South Carolina Union regiments and uh, it stands as a record to their gallantry. It is also, by the way, as far as I know, the only artifact in South Carolina uh, directly related to Harriet Tubman. You see, Harriet Tubman served as an intelligence person for this unit during the summer of 1861. And let me get back to my little slideshow here and give you perhaps a close up on that particular banner. Maybe you can see a little more clearly here the damage to that banner. Um, another silk banner, very worn out. I'm trying to. Here we go, imitate. You look in this area right here, a little bit of developing museum folklore. Some of the kids who have visited have said that this bit of um, degeneration in the silk looks like a soldier holding a rifle with an attached bayonet. And it is an interesting little pattern to have developed in the silk. And I don't discourage anything. It makes young people look a little more closely at history. Okay, we're going to roll on into our education room for a little bit of a close up with a couple artifacts today. Which the collection staff was kind enough to pull for our contemplation. do look forward to once more being able to hold our homeschool Fridays in person in my education room here. But for now, got a couple of things for you to see closer up than you would be able to if you were here, since these are items that have actually been pulled out of the box. Hmm. Actually, before we get to the PD rifles, Flag. The artifacts we have that don't make it out into the gallery very often are holes from which these flags have been detached. Uh, this was used for a company flag, the Monticello Guards of South Carolina. I'm trying to get back far enough. This one is the flag pole of the Monticello Guards. And I'm going to bring that finial a little bit closer to you. This is a rather decorative and not very functional brass finial on the end of this pole. But sometimes the finials on these flags, by the way, the finial that I'm talking about, that's, that's this thing, the spear point on top of the flag. They were indeed functional in times of desperate need. At least once, the finial of the flag of the 10th South Carolina wound up being used in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. A 
All right, I'm back and we're gonna take a closer look at this banner. What's left of it, that is. This is the flag of a unit that was originally known as the PD Rifles and later became the PD Light Artillery. This banner was from Florence, South Carolina. And we have to fill in what used to be here, the date on the bottom of the palmetto is July 21st, 1861. That's the date of the first Battle of Manassas. But these men were not there. Uh, in fact, it just so happened that on the day that first Manassas, which some call first Bull Run was being fought, this unit was being organized for the first time back home in Florence. So that's just a coincidence. But the words which were painted on the flag under this sign, it said, we will conquer. And we see that sign, uh, we see that phrase on a number of different military banners under this sign, we will conquer. Uh, sometimes you see it in Latin, in Hoxinio Vincit. Under this sign, we will conquer. They are quoting a well-known phrase from the Roman Emperor Constantine, who changed the standards of the Roman legions to bear the cross at the time when he converted to Christianity, saying he had seen a vision that told him under this sign, that is the sign of the cross, uh, you will conquer. But here under the sign of the Palmetto, the PD light artillery marched away. They were a well disciplined unit. They were a unit with a very good reputation. The young lady who gave them the flag, who was, was um, chosen to be the one to make the presentation, uh, was um, the battery commander, or the at that time, the company commander, McIntosh's daughter. And a lady chosen to present one of these flags usually was young, single, and of good family. Um, you she was selected from the local community somehow. Uh, there wasn't an election, but often she's the sort of person you'd think of as maybe would be the homecoming queen. Um, and uh, the presentation of the flag would involve a little speech, a little inspiring speech, and a, a pretty young lady presenting the flag to the unit. Uh, and this would be featured in the newspaper. There'd be a little story about it. And then the PD rifles marched away to become the PD Light Artillery. And the PD Light Artillery, they were converted over to an artillery unit because of the availability of some guns, the necessity of um, another artillery unit, and the belief that this was a well-disciplined, um, high-quality unit that would be able to do a good job uh, as artillery soldiers. And they would fight as artillery soldiers for the remainder of the war. So this banner was with the Army of Northern Virginia. It was often very close to um, General Lee himself and other great well-known figures of the leadership of that famous army uh, and would see ferocious action. And it was at the Battle of Sharpsburg or Antietam that this banner garnered the story that the veterans would tell the most. There was, with this unit, another 16-year-old soldier, uh, just like James Taylor, who I referenced earlier. And this young man's name was Baxter Rollins. Uh, Baxter Rollins from near Florence, uh, he was given the job of the color bearer for this artillery battery. That was a little different from being the color bearer for an infantry unit. Uh, we talked about how the fight around an infantry flag could be just ferocious, uh, that the, the capture or the protection of the flag uh, involved fierce, often hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and how at Gaines Mill, five color bearers for just one flag fell. Well, it was probably less than five minutes. Well, for an artillery battery, the same emphasis uh, was placed upon the guns themselves, the cannons. Uh, to capture or defend the guns, not the, not the flag, uh, was where the honor and the uh, 
uh, intensity of an artillery unit's morale rested. And so perhaps, perhaps young Baxter felt like he'd been pushed out into a, a, a safe position because he was the youngest there or something. Um, in any case, at Sharpsburg, when a man at one of the guns uh, was struck and fell, young Baxter Rollins planted the banner in the ground and dashed forward uh, to take the position at the cannon that is known as number four position. Uh, that is the soldier who pulls the lanyard to fire the weapon. And the fighting was intense and close. Charge after charge advanced toward this battery of artillery and they were fighting back with what's called canister shot, which basically makes your cannon into a, into a giant shotgun. Uh, and they're blasting back with canister at the advancing enemy and young Baxter Rollins has fired a few shots and he has the lanyard in his hand ready to fire another shot when he himself was struck by a piece of shell in the side. And when Baxter was hit, apparently, it struck him in the side and he, he had the lanyard in his hand and apparently he fell. And as he fell, his body weight pulled the lanyard and the cannon went off. Well, you won't see this generally at reenactments because at a reenactment, the cannon is firing gunpowder but no projectile. But these weapons, when firing a projectile, had quite a bit of recoil. And that cannon would roll backwards and need to be rolled back into position for each shot. And so Baxter fell and falling pulled the lanyard and the piece went off and recoiled and it crushed his leg as well. Well, Baxter laying there on the ground in terrible condition, and the first sergeant of the unit, a man named Joe Brunson. Uh, the first sergeant was only 19 years old himself. And Baxter grabbed at the first sergeant and, and he asked him a question and, and poor Joe Brunson had to, um, had to make a decision over whether to tell the truth or not. Because Baxter Rollins asked, I, Sergeant, I'm, I'm not gonna make it, am I? And Joe Brunson looked down at the young man on the ground and the severity of his wound and he said, no, Baxter, no, yeah, I don't think you're gonna make it. And so Baxter Rollins said, then don't let him carry me away. Carry me and lay me under that flag. If I got to die, I want to die underneath my flag. That's what they did with Baxter. He was never carried to the rear, he would die of his wounds later that day. And that would be the story that was told to the, the children and the wives and everyone who gathered at the unit's reunions whenever the flag of the, of the PD rifles was brought out to be seen. Um, that is the story that would be told each time, the story of Baxter Rollins. The flag was not surrendered. In fact, I was folded up real tight and carried home and given back to Miss McIntosh, the young lady who had been the one to give the little speech a few years earlier to give it to the men. And they brought it back to her, very proud that this flag had not been surrendered at the end of the war, that it had been smuggled home instead. She hid it through the years of reconstruction uh, they would begin to bring the flag out once a year after that for their annual picnic. And when they did, they would tell the story of Baxter Rollins and they would allow their kids to handle the flag, which is why we have half a piece of silk here probably, was uh, this flag was just loved to death at these commemorative events after the war. But that flag would also become part of the story of the preservation of history. Um, taking us all the way back to my buddy, Theodore Roosevelt. Take a second, I'm gonna skip through and get to him. Come on, Teddy, where are you? There we go. 
Theodore Roosevelt wrote that terrific essay, The Flag Bearers, about the bravery of young men carrying the flag in the 1860s, and with the message that that bravery belonged to everybody, to every American as part of his inheritance. And after he became president, Theodore Roosevelt would be one of the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room's greatest benefactors because of that kind of thinking. You see, President Roosevelt thought it was time to return the captured banners home to their home states, the ones that have been captured or surrendered at the end of the war 40 years earlier. Um, he believed that the Southern boys had done a terrific job in the Spanish-American War in which he himself had fought. Uh, and that in the reunited country, the right thing to do with historic flags was not to let them slowly rot in a government warehouse, but rather return them to their home states to be put in their museums and so forth. And so those which he sent to South Carolina were placed in the Relic Room, which was at that time a fairly new museum. They were only about 10 years old then. And when he did, other soldiers would come forward to say, well, if the flags are gonna be in that new museum, we want our flag to be there too. And we kind of forgot to surrender ours. Um, in one case, the flag was in a safe deposit box in a bank in Darlington, South Carolina. Uh, and these flags were brought in to be put on display. One person who did that was Sergeant Joe Brunson, uh, the, the same he had been, the 19-year-old first sergeant. Uh, and he gave the flag of his unit to the governor for placement in the relic room with a little speech. He said, into your hands I give this flag. This one has never felt the touch of hostile hands. Uh, and so, with pride, this was placed in the relic room. And a couple of decades later, about a decade later, uh, the United States entered into World War I. And Joe Brunson, who had been so proud of his unsurrendered banner, gave talks, recruiting talks, to the young men of South Carolina to tell them that the right way to carry the valor of their ancestors forward was in United States service. Joe Brunson had two sons who served in World War I. And the last speech that he was scheduled to give in his life was a patriotic speech. And he, he showed up at the event at which he was supposed to speak. Um, but he had suffered a stroke two days earlier, and he could not speak. And so his prepared script was given to one of those sons who stood up and gave the speech in his behalf and carried that record of valor forward, just as the young man with the flag of the first uh, at Gaines Mill carried the physical flag itself forward. So these flags remain a, a thing of great interest to me. Um, the, these flags remain artifacts. I think we can profit from considering and thinking about. Uh, I hope some of you agree with that. I see we're still a fairly elite group at the end of this presentation today. Okay, well, thank you all. I do appreciate the time you in, invested with this little program this morning. Um, and uh, more Homeschool Fridays and, and other programs to come.